This is a recording from a Sunday meeting of the BC Humanist Association in Vancouver. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the BCHA or its board of directors. To learn more about humanism and to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the BC Humanist Podcast. And today, as you must all know, because there's so many of you here, as I said, magic must be a hot topic. We've got uh, The Psychology of Magic by Robert Kessler. He's a member of the Magic Circle in London, Britain, and uh, he has a degree in experimental psychology, which field he worked in, researched on that. He left the academia to pursue a more creative path. So we welcome Robert, and as I said, he's a big draw. (laughs) (laughs) I also also told him we're hoping for tricks. (laughs) Hi, everyone. My name is Robert. Uh, and I am a magician and a psychologist, and also just a generalist weirdo. So I'll be doing all sorts of strange things today, and I'll be talking about all sorts of strange things that people have done and believed over the past 100 years, 150 years or so. So uh, we'll start with the origins of magic and psychology and modern science. How's that for a start? In the mid-1800s, people were really interested in trying to understand things that seemed impossible. So, uh, first off, there was the birth of spiritualism. Starting out uh, in fringe religious groups in the burned-out district of New York State, people started coming to connect religious beliefs with the idea that you could communicate with people after they were dead. And all sorts of people, both believers and charlatans who were taking advantage of this, started coming out of the woodwork all over the eastern United States and traveling all over the states, up to Canada, over the Atlantic, into England and throughout the continent, and performing shows, giving illustrated lectures, and otherwise trying to prove to people that there was life beyond death because you could talk to people after they had died. At the same time, there was this... Uh, rebirth of experimental science. Uh, There was a bit of a a lull in the early 1800s. And then uh, with the uptake and usage of electricity uh, in experimentation in the mid 1800s and all sorts of interesting experiments in light and uh, ultimately culminating in uh, biological sciences having a huge boost with uh, the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species. So There's this huge cultural shift happening in the mid-1800s where people are starting to investigate things that were previously thought uninvestigatable. Understanding the laws of physics by experimenting with electricity. Understanding how life came to be beyond just God did it. And trying to also understand if you could go beyond life and understand what happens after death. And one person did more than anyone else to promote the spread of spiritualism, starting from the late 1800s and moving all the way into the 1900s. And that man's name was Henry Slade. Dr. Henry Slade, although there's no record of him ever having a medical degree of any kind, but Dr. Henry Slade he was, and he became famous for performing slate writing. He could receive messages from beyond the grave, by uh, having the spirits write on slate boards with chalk. Uh, And he became incredibly popular for this. Uh, And uh, he traveled around the eastern United States, uh, and people believed him and pushed him up in the press, and this led to a huge rise in spiritualism, uh, thanks also to the Fox sisters, who you may have heard, who heard ghosts uh, in their living room when they were young children. created this this spiritualist movement. And Henry Slate took people for all that they were worth uh, until he was accused of cheating. And when that happened, he just moved on to the next town, worked there until he was accused of cheating by those people. And eventually he kept being accused of cheating so much in the United States that it got a little hot and he went across the Atlantic 
uh, and started reforming England. There, he captured the interest of a couple of people who worked for uh, Darwin and other people in the biological sciences at the time, who sent their assistants and friends to see Henry Slade perform. And one of them noticed that something was happening under the table and accused Slade of cheating. And not only that, took him to court under the Witchcraft Act. <laughs> and so it became the trial of the century. This got an enormous amount of press in Britain at the time. The trial lasted three days, and people of uh, both sides uh, supporting and uh, attacking Henry Slade came out to testify uh, in support or to attack him. Uh, amongst the people who did this, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle came in and defended Slade. And uh, one of the founding members of the Magic Circle, of which I'm a member, uh, came to uh, say, look, this is all rubbish because I can replicate everything that Slade does using standard magical uh, methods. And uh, Neville Maskelyne sort of uh, took over the trial for an entire day and just used it as, a, as an excuse to perform magic and promote his theater just down the road. <laughs> uh, but this, this lasted for so long, and he was convicted of witchcraft, specifically fraudulent witchcraft, uh, <laughs> until uh, he appealed it. Uh, sent out uh, an appeal with, with some uh, with the help of lawyers and, and, and the enormous amount of money he had made by traveling around the country. Uh, and he got off on a technicality because the Witchcraft Act actually only says that you can convict someone if they're doing fraudulent palmistry. And he never did any palm reading as part of his shows. Uh, while this appeal was in process, just before it was announced, he fled to France. <laughs> got a little loot hut, he left. Uh, he performed in France for a bit further, uh, got a little hot, left to Germany, started picking his way across the continent. Now, at the same time this was happening, early experimental psychology was starting to be born. There were, especially in Germany, where uh, Slade was headed, a number of scientists who were interested in optical illusions. They were collecting them pretty much since the beginning of the, uh, the 1800s and moving all the way to the next century, collecting things that didn't seem to be what they were to your eyes. Uh, and this, this captured the interest of some of the uh, German astrophysicists and other people who were studying lights and optics. One of them was named Zollner, uh, Johann Karl Friedrich Zollner, uh, who, amongst other things, potentially coined the term redshift and uh, proved one of Doppler's theories about shifting frequencies of light coming from astronomical uh, settings. And he collected these optical illusions because he thought he could explain them by understanding the properties of light and optics. So this is one of the earliest optical illusions we know of. It's called the Zollner diagonal lines. The, the lines sort of look like they're tilting in opposite directions. Here's another one. Uh, these are the uh, moon parallel lines. Uh, they look like they're slightly bowed inward. And so there was a whole group of German scientists who were collecting these optical illusions. And some of them uh, hear about Slade, and they're interested in whether he's doing this for real or whether it's some kind of optical illusion. This is where magic and science first sort of collide. Magicians had been using scientific principles sort of uh, without really investigating them for at least a century before this, if not uh, you know, a millennium. But this is the first time that scientists have actually decided to specifically investigate a specific magical phenomenon in order to understand whether it's real or not. There was that, that, that part where we're trying to see if this might not be real is really, really important. And the specific thing that Zoller became interested in was one of Slade's mediumistic stunts where he was able to knot a rope without taking his hands off of the ends of the rope. Uh, from above, he would have essentially his, his thumbs tied and stuck on top of the ends of the rope. 
and during a blackout portion of the seance, quickly knots would appear in the bulk of the room. And uh, Zollner saw this a couple of times, and he thought this was so fascinating that he invited some of his scientist friends to come along. Amongst them, uh, two of the core founders of psychology as an experimental science, Gustav Fechner and Wilhelm Wundt. Now, Fechner totally bought into this and actually published a letter in support of Zollner saying this is 100% the real deal. There's something really, really cool going on here. And it was with the support of Fechner and, and other people like that that Zollner actually published a paper called Transcendental Physics in which he argued uh, for the existence of a fourth dimension, saying that spirits were actually fourth dimensional beings that were able to, amongst other things, knot ropes without having to move the ends, because that's the only possible explanation. Somewhat presaging uh, modern physics acceptance of fourth and other higher dimensions, though even from strange places to become the truth. Meanwhile, Wundt thought this was total bollocks, uh, and he argued that what you're seeing is just as much as an optical illusion as the lines that you yourself discovered. So, uh, and he published an article in Popular Mechanics in the late 1800s, which as near as I can tell is the first uh, skeptical debunking of mediumistic studs. On the basis of his uh, total embarrassments in the public eye after this public sided with Wundt, Zollner was kicked out of his lab at Leipzig University. Wundt took it over and founded the very first experimental psychology lab. And from that point on, experimental psychologists have been interested in magicians and magic and mediumistic stunts and things that seem inexplicable, but that we could attempt to explain using psychological principles rather than necessarily coming up with natural laws. The idea that things that you can't understand can be explained by something going on in your mind rather than out there in the world. And as uh, more and more people started debunking spiritualist mediums, as the turn of the century occurred, uh, magicians started performing magic tricks without presenting them as spiritualistic or mediumistic stunts. And so psychology started studying magicians. Uh, there was quite a few number of papers. Uh, Alfred Binet, who amongst other things invented the IQ test, uh, did some studies on uh, magicians. Uh, uh, and uh, it sort of all ended up here. Norman Triplett, publishing in 1900, a huge paper that was developed, uh, changed, and edited from his uh, graduate thesis, The Psychology of Conjuring Deceptions, where he tries to explain how various magic tricks work and why people experience certain effects purely through psychological principles that were known at the time. And one of the tricks that he describes is the vanishing ball illusion, which is performed here uh, in this video. Oof, the ball's gone. And that was it. Ah. For the next hundred years or so, no one really studied magic anymore. No one really knows why. There's been a smattering of things here and there. Uh, there's been some stuff on, uh, on how cold reading works, and Richard Wiseman sort of started doing some things in the mid-90s. Uh, there was an attempt to explain why there's a disparity between the number of uh, male and female magicians in the 80s. But aside from that, there was no real attempt to understand magic from a psychological perspective. No one really knows why. I think possibly around this time, uh, just after the turn of the century, psychology was trying to be taken more seriously as an experimental science. They decided to put away childish things and study more serious things. But this gent here, Gustav Kuhn, my uh, former PhD supervisor, in 2005 decided enough is enough. Uh, he was a magician. He trained as a street performer and uh, went into university and thought, actually, magic involves a lot of psychology. What if I can combine the two? My thesis on that. And he found the triplet paper and saw the vanishing ball illusion and decided to film it and see what happened when he showed it to people in the lab. And this restarted interest in psychology of magic. But 
Meanwhile, psychology had been doing all sorts of other stuff since the 1900s that didn't involve magic. So we'll backtrack a little and go back to the 1900s and give you a crash course in uh, the psychology of illusions uh, so that we can bring you up to speed when I start talking about modern research in the psychology of magic. Uh, this is uh, an older illusion collected in, a, in a, a book that Edward Titchener published in the 1930s, which collected all of these optical illusions that had been uh, discovered in the previous century by various people who just cobbled them together out of whenever they noticed them. Uh, so it's called the uh, Titchener Circles. Uh, and the idea is that this circle looks smaller than this circle. I mean, hopefully you can see that. When you remove the surrounding circles, of course, they're the same size. So this is a, uh, an example of an illusion that where the context is affecting your perceptions. Right? The, the things that are surrounding the circles are influencing your perception of the, the circles in the middle. Even though you sort of rationally know, obviously, they're the same size, something is tweaking your perception so that you can't really override that perception. Here's another example. A couple, couple of uh, decades later, in the 1990s, Adelson's checkerboard illusion. Uh, most people, when asked, see A as a darker square than B. They are the exact same shade of gray, the same luminance. An explanation for this is that it is, again, a context illusion. Only here, the context is much stronger, so the illusion is much stronger than the circles. And the context here is that we know what color the squares on a checkerboard are supposed to be. We know that A is supposed to be black and B is supposed to be white. So already, our foreknowledge of how checkerboards work is influencing our perception. Not only that, but we know that B is in shadow, so that it's going to look darker than it actually is in real life. So our perceptual system somehow corrects for this, and we perceive it as lighter than it actually is. And it's only when we do a little Photoshop and smear that way across that we see their true colors. It's really hard to ignore context when we're constructing a perception. So not only that, uh, we've got the Phoenicia Triangle here. Uh, People sometimes, when they look at this figure, see a white triangle on top of another black triangle and some black circles. Some people even report that the interior of this triangle is a brighter white than the background. I assure you it's not, uh, and there is no triangle there. It's just three Pac-Men and some angles. But we still sort of see it through uh, what some of the early German psychologists, always goes back to the Germans, called Gestalt principles, principle good continuation. We're drawing in lines because that makes more sense than having a collection of disparate figures that look almost as if there were lines connecting them, but there aren't. We go for a sort of simpler idea. We make assumptions. That's, that's the main theory about how these kinds of optical movements work. We make assumptions about how the world works. The context influences our assumptions. And those assumptions usually work out right for us, but sometimes they lead us down the wrong path. So you don't see things the way they really are. You make an assumption about what they might be like based on everything you know about them and everything that's around them at the time. Sometimes it makes you even see things that aren't there. Not only that, it's not just static images. As your eyes move across this, you might see some spinning. This is a totally static figure. So you can see things move that aren't moving. So all sorts of visual illusions can occur based on this principle of making an assumption about what's going on there and being influenced by the context. So psychologists are interested in these illusions because by varying the content of the illusions and the way we present them to people, changing the context and how much people know about them, you change what people perceive. And by doing that, you can sort of map out the edges of the perceptual system. You can start to learn how perception works by seeing how it fails. One theory as to why this is happening is that the world is incredibly complex. Our sensory apparatus is taking in light, sound, touch, etc., all of this different information we would need a brain the size of this room and to be constantly eating to have enough energy to process all of that information. 
it would be incredibly inefficient. So instead, we ignore the vast majority of this information, just throw it away, doesn't matter. And then what information we do take in, we just make some shortcut assumptions about it. Way more efficient, and it usually works out fine. After all, you've managed to survive this long. Here's one that you can try for yourself. Every time this image blinks, something about it is changing. When you know what it is, raise your hand. One person so far. I'm going to give you a few more hints. It's two, three. It's something very important, absolutely crucial to the proper functioning of the main element of this image. It's about 10 people. It's oh. uh, so about half the room. <laughs> if, if this thing really was blinking in and out of existence like it is, the airplane couldn't function. Still, not everyone has their arms up. <laughs> everyone see it now? The engine is disappearing and reappearing. So you'd think you'd notice that, but some people don't until you specifically point it out to them. Why might this be happening? Well, it goes back to that efficiency theory. We're throwing out the vast majority of visual information. We don't actually need it. So this is actually related to the structure of the eye. Uh, the distribution of the visual receptors in the back of your eye isn't even. They're much more clustered in the center in what's called the fovea. And they sort of start dropping off as you go from there. And you don't even see in color past around here. The rest of it is mostly in black and white. Uh, if you hold out your arm and just look at the size of your thumbnail, that's roughly the size of your visual field in which you're getting any detailed image information at all. It drops off sharply from there. The rest of it is essentially your brain making stuff up about what it thinks should be there based on the last time you looked or what you know. The vast majority of information is thrown out and the rest is assumptions. So when your eyes are scanning this image, trying to figure out what's changing about it, you don't know what to look for. Your fovea is just sort of zipping around, looking at things that might be of interest. You don't really know what to look for. As I start giving you more information, you can narrow your focus. Your attention can shift. Your knowledge, and therefore your assumptions, start narrowing in. Oh, it's something, okay, the main feature of the image, the plane. So I'll ignore everything else and just look at the plane. Blinking in and out of existence. Oh, now I know what the change is. So let's look for something that is there and then isn't there. So as I give you more information, you get more knowledge, you can shift your attention, you can change the assumptions you're making. So this is an example of how your uh, amount of knowledge changes your perception. And your perception doesn't notice everything because it's throwing away what it doesn't think is important. Uh, this is called change blindness, because you're blind to the change. Now, this doesn't just happen for static images on the screen. It can happen in real life. Uh, so I'll give you an example. <laughs> I've actually been replaced with a mannequin. <laughs> so uh, we did that about 30 times in uh, Spitalfields Market, uh, just down the street from Liverpool Street Station in London, and pretty much nobody noticed it. And we didn't actually think that the thing with the mannequin work. That was something that the History Channel asked us to do for this uh, this, this uh, Cold War documentary. Uh, there's this story of this spy who escaped the KGB. He was like a, a, a double agent uh, by uh, having his wife replace him with a dummy when they were in a car park. He just booked it while they kept chasing after the car that had the dummy in it. Uh, and we didn't think it would work, and it totally did. It was really, really surprising. So you don't even need to replace a person with an actual living person. We did a couple more things that, that I cut out of this. Uh, we replaced me with a short blonde girl. People didn't notice. Uh, the changes can be really quite drastic. And just, just, just nobody notices because we don't need to, right? In general, things don't change when we're not looking. So we don't have to constantly be updating. That would be totally inefficient. We just go with what we already know and just assume everything is fine. Uh, so one of the other elements of this is that people also have their attention split, right? They're trying to do a difficult task. They're helping someone navigate on a map. So they have to orient it, you have to focus on it. So their attention is actually focused on something else. And when your attention is split, 
this makes it even harder. There's a theory called the load theory of attention, that when you're, when you're, when you're carrying a load, your attention doesn't have the ability to fully function. So even though it's already quite impoverished, impoverished because we're throwing so much information away, when you're trying to do something difficult, it gets even worse. Well, I'll give you an example. Many of you will have seen this video before. If you have, say nothing, don't laugh, just go along with the instructions. If you haven't seen this video before, you're in for a treat. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. I did say not to laugh. <laughs> did everyone get that? Okay, who saw the gorilla? Who's seen the video before? not to get complacent. <laughs> just because you know about something, just because you think you understand the cognitive illusion or you've seen it before, it doesn't mean you're immune to it. Uh, so we can start doing this kind of attentional research. Uh, that's an example of inattentional blindness. And you can push it further and further into the real world. Because it's one thing to study something in the lab, but you also want to make sure that it works in the real world. That's why we move change blindness out into the real world with that person swap study. And you can also put inattentional blindness out into the real world with this study. Uh, Ira Hyman uh, and his graduate student here, who uh, is also a professional clown. Uh, graduate students don't make a lot of money, which is why many of us also work as clowns and magicians. <laughs> Uh, and the idea behind this study was that they uh, had an army of undergraduate students who would mark down who was walking across the central quadrants of the University of Western Washington and note whether they were chatting with someone, whether they were chatting with someone on the phone, or whether they were listening to music. And the people who were chatting with someone on the phone were pretty much incapable of noticing this clown who was unicycling and juggling and honking his horn and generally being a nuisance, as clowns do, uh, people didn't notice him because their attention was focused on the phone conversation. And this was different from the people who were chatting with someone who was physically present because it actually takes more attention to understand what someone is saying when you can't see uh, their face or their body, which is something that will come up again later. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, she said distracted driving. So... Think about that the next time you're using hands-free. It doesn't matter if uh, you're talking with someone on a phone that you're holding versus one that you're not holding, because it's about your attention being split, not the fact that you're holding something. Uh, and there is a lot of research in actual live driving situations using this same paradigm that shows that it really severely impacts your ability to drive. So this attentional research actually has real consequences even though it was discovered by a clown. So the core of this research, attention and awareness, is that attention is a limited resource. You only have so much of it that you can allocate to things. And if you're paying a lot of attention to one thing, you can't allocate it elsewhere. So imagine you're walking down the street, and you see a car barrel through a red light, screech as it tries to brake to avoid some pedestrians, careen out of control and crash into a lamppost. And you're approached by the police as a witness, and they ask you, uh, how fast was the car going when it hit the lamppost? You might give your best guess. Now, imagine you're in an experimental psychology experiment, and one group of people is asked, how fast was the car going when it hit the lamppost? And the other group is asked, how fast was the car going when it smashed into the lamppost? And that group gives a higher speed estimate. Now, this was an experiment that was being conducted to, to sort of understand how priming worked. But through a strange error uh, on the part of one of the experimenters who was running it, uh, in the video that they were watching, it was a red car. And some people were accidentally asked, how fast was the black car going? And people vividly remember black car. 
So you can remember things that haven't actually happened. This uh, inspired Elizabeth Loftus to do some groundbreaking experiments in something called false memory, where she brought uh, susceptible young children with their guardians into the lab and told them all about that, that time you remember. It must have been maybe four. Uh, we were in the mall. This mall right here, and, and uh, we got separated, I think, in the safe way, and you got lost, and you had to go to the information booth, and they had to make an announcement. Does anyone remember that? And many of these children did sort of remember that. And then when they asked them for some more details about that a week later, they embellished it and added more details and remembered it even more vividly. So you can get kids to remember stuff that never happened by essentially having their loved ones lie to them. <laughs> They were all debriefed later. Elizabeth Loftus has gone on to do some very important work. And, and, uh, perhaps you've heard of the Satanic Panic, where uh, many people thought that they were being uh, ritually abused as children. And Elizabeth Loftus came in as an expert witness to say, no, actually, the therapist accidentally implanted a false memory. And for this good deed, she received death threats and a bomb on her front doorstep. But from these origins, uh, you can actually extend the research and do all sorts of other false memories. Uh, you can do it with adults. Remember that time we were on vacation and we went on a hot air balloon and it actually got unmoored and we sort of floated away for a few hours? You can convince adults that this happened. And it's not just plausible memories. You can convince people that uh, when they were kids, uh, we went to Disneyland, right? And, and you were really afraid of the characters and their costumes. And uh, like there was Bugs Bunny there and like we had to sort of encourage you to go shake his hand and have a hug. We did get a picture of you with him. Uh, and it worked out okay. But that never happened because Bugs Bunny is not a Disney character. <laughs> but people still believed it. So we can remember things that haven't happened just by the functioning, the normal functioning of our memory system. Because in general, we don't need to remember things. Just like we don't need to constantly be checking our surroundings and updating, we don't need to remember things. So it is actually quite efficient for us not to store things that accurately. Or in fact, not to store things at all. Experience we demanded. If we don't see things the way they really are, if we can be influenced by context, if people can implant false memories into us, perhaps magic can be explained using just those principles. We'll get back to that, but magic has other benefits for experimental psychology. Deception has long been a tool used in psychology. This is a picture of Stanley Milgram standing beside his famous shock box. If you don't know about those studies, it was uh, about obedience. There's a person in the next room, and uh, you're training them in a reading test. It's like a memory learning paradigm. And every time they get something wrong, you need to shock them. Right? First, you'll start here with a mild electric shock, and you'll feel them go, Youch! Uh, in the other room. You, they keep getting stuff wrong, and eventually you get here, and they start screaming. Uh, you get around here, uh, they just stop responding entirely. And you start feeling a little hinky about doing this, and the experimenter says uh, the experiment requires that you continue. Mm -hmm. He's wearing a lab coat, so it must be legit. <laughs> and eventually you get over here, where uh, there aren't even any numbers anymore, it's just three red X's. And the only reason this was allowed to happen was because it wasn't really happening. It was deception. It was designed to make sure that the participant didn't really understand what was going on because of experimental and obedience effects, right? If you're trying to study what happens when you tell people to do something, if people are participating in an experiment and they're trying to figure out what you want, they're trying to be a good experimental subject. They're going to try and please you. So there's a bias that creeps in there. So sometimes when you're trying to study something where a lot of bias can creep in, you need to design an experiment that deceives the participant about what's actually happening so you get an accurate conception of how people behave in that situation. Now, this has been replicated in slightly different circumstances because uh, uh, this is one of the reasons that ethics boards now exist, because it's going a little far. But if you're going to use deception to construct studies, why not ask the experts, the magicians? They think about these issues all the time. They might be better at it than some Harrow graduate students. Because magicians are perceptual experts. Throughout centuries of trial and error, they have discovered many of the same optical illusions and scientific principles that psychologists have been studying independently. So there are some things in the magic literature which 
are not yet understood or written about or studied by psychology. By digging through that literature, you can find stuff that is just brand new to science, or at least gives you a new perspective or a new tool. Here's an example of that. Um, I hope it's all right that I expose one element of a very old rope trick. Uh, I did actually check with uh, the editor of the Magic Circular at the Magic Circle to make sure that it was okay to reveal certain secrets in this talk, so um, I should be covered. I won't be sent to the bad place. Um, so uh, this is actually based on the principle of good continuation, which is the same reason you saw that illusory triangle. The Gestalt psychologist has covered that. We assume things continue even when they are discontinuous. And that is the explanation behind this road trip. One I guess, sort of obvious thing that you might not consider, but it's really important, is that magic allows you to do impossible things, or at least things that appear impossible. So, for example, if you want to change one person into another person in an experiment, you could set up an incredibly elaborate scenario with builders carrying a board and a mannequin and hidden cameras and some guy with a map. Or you could just ask the guy who changes tigers into ladies every night in front of an audience in Vegas. Many of the same techniques that Mitchinson use can create impossible scenarios in a live situation that can then be studied. So for example, uh, Peter Johansson, who was my master supervisor, wanted to see if he could use change blindness in real life using magician's techniques in order to study something else. So imagine I'm showing you uh, two cards. We're sitting across the table from each other. And I ask you, all right, I'm showing you these two pictures. Uh, which do you prefer? Which do you think is more attractive? And point to one. And then I use a magician's technique to switch them as I turn them face down. And I hand you the one that you did not choose. And then I ask you to take another look. Most people won't notice the difference because of change blindness. And then not only that, I ask you, and I'll explain why you chose this one. Of the people who didn't notice the change, about 80%, then justify this choice using details on the image, even though it was the one that they did not choose. That one's a little insidious. <laughs> You'll be thinking about it at 2 a.m. <laughs> Now, okay, this is a subjective decision. Perhaps there was no rational process that went into making the choice. You're just like, yeah, I guess I like the brunette, whatever. So what happens if we do it for something a little more important? During uh, the run-up to a important election in Sweden, Petter and some grad students created fake questionnaires that acted as a political compass. Do this little short quiz, and we'll tell you what party you should vote for. But before we start, we ask you what party you intend to vote for. Then we go through the electional quiz, and we overlay a little compass answer sheet on it and tell you, OK, it seems you're aligned with this party. All right? But while people are doing this, we have a second copy of the questionnaire, and we change their answers. <coughs> so perhaps you disagree with, like, no warrant surveillance. We change your answer to say you do. Then we overlay it on top of the original answers. And then we show it to you again with the little election compass. And say, all right, it looks like you're in line with this party. And then we ask them to discuss their reasoning behind their opinion on certain issues. And we tell them, oh, which party would you like to vote for? And we can push around which party people intend to vote for, and change their opinion on very important election issues. Terrifying, I know. Change blindness. Magician's tricks. That's all it takes to swing an entire election. It'll be up at 2 a.m. <laughs> Back to magic. Don't worry, it's just light entertainment. <laughs> One really nice thing about magic is that it replicates. Right? In, in the world of modern experimental psychology, there's, you might have heard of the replication crisis. Uh, so many things don't actually replicate. You, you find a strong effect, and then someone else tries it, and it just doesn't work. 
a nice thing about magic tricks is that because they have been developed through trial and error in front of real audiences, in front of different situations, thousands and thousands of times by many different people, tricks replicate. Tricks work every single time. If they didn't, you wouldn't perform them. So this is genuinely really strong with effects. So this is something that's worth studying and worth using as a technique in your experiments because it works every time, which is kind of a miracle in the modern world of psychology where something is great if it works 60% of the time for industrialized, white, educated, uh, undergraduate psychology students inside the lab who are sitting on the computer for two hours watching space bar when they see the circle. So here's an example. This is Mac King vanishing a coin. There it goes. This is an experiment done by Steve Macknick and Susanna martinez Pond. We published a book called Slights of Minds. So if you want some more information, you can read that. Uh, and they worked with some magicians in Vegas, including Mac King, and they showed participants videos of Mac King vanishing coins. But many people didn't notice how this this uh, trick worked and, and kept seeing the coin vanish over and over and over. So there are certain sites that just replicate over and over and over, and we have experimental proof that they do so. So we have this set of techniques that we can build on. And my personal favorite element of magic is misdirection. This is the idea that you have a set of techniques that can manipulate where the audience is paying attention and what they're aware of by making you allocate your attention to a certain location and combining it with techniques like change blindness and false memory, we can get you to experience magic. So one element of misdirection is, is time misdirection. Uh, the idea that the method behind the trick actually happens outside of the scope of when you think the magic is happening. There are some magicians in England that are really irritated that I'm revealing this, but I'm not going to say any more than that, that sometimes the magic happens when you don't think it is happening. Uh, and there have been experiments on that. So some colleagues over at McGill, at Amir Raza's lab, did some studies where they vanished a pen, and the magic happened at different times uh, with respect to the method. And they wanted to see whether people's perception of time changed as a result of misdirection being used to change the method uh, timing of the trick. But I'm not going to be talking about time misdirection for the, 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 the last part of it. I'm going to be talking specifically about spatial misdirection. This is about getting you to pay attention to the wrong location in space rather than in time. Zolder's fourth dimension again. <laughs> oh, it comes back around. But well, perhaps you'd like a demonstration. <laughs> so enough science. <laughs> um, I may need to step away from the mic for this. I will try and yell as loudly as possible. But this is mostly a visual trick, so it should be fun. All right? Uh, we just need a few cards. So um, I, know. I, I got jumbo index um, cards, so hopefully everyone will be able to see this. Just need a few. Um, can everyone see these? You can all read that? Show my stand in the center. You in here? OK. <laughs> uh, ace, two, three, and four, that's all you really need to pay attention to. Just remember the numbers. And if you're paying attention to the numbers and not to my face or my voice, you'd be able to tell me what card I just turned face up. Is anyone paying attention? <laughs> I know, it's hard, isn't it? It's actually the two. Because what happens is I start talking, and you look at my face just like you did now, and that lets me do the dirty work down here. So what card did it look like I turned face up just now? <laughs> Two? Three. Okay, do not take your eyes off the cards. All right? Just keep looking there. Stop looking at my face! <laughs> <laughs> Even when I tell people, it's really hard to ignore. It's the context. It's, 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 it's allocation of attention. So it looked like the three. It's changed into the four. I am cheating a little, so... Let's try and make this a little easier. What card is face up now? Ace. Are you sure about that? Well, you're right, but you're only a quarter right, because they're all face up now. <laughs> but here's the thing. Misdirection is about getting you to pay attention to one thing, so you can't pay attention to another. 
I've been talking about the faces of the cards, but does anyone remember what color the backs were? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> So that's a nice example because it, it really shows you how difficult it is to ignore certain social cues. I, I start talking, I start making eye contact, you look at my face even when I tell you not to. It's really, really hard to ignore. So the rest of this talk is going to focus in on some research in magic that looks specifically at the use of social cues in an area of research called social attention, real world attention. When we are talking to each other in the real world, we're using social cues, such as our eye movements, our voice, our head position, our body tilt, and pointing, and hand gestures. All of these cues are telling each other whose turn it is to talk, who we should pay attention to, and other elements of social interaction. So magicians take advantage of our automatic responses to these cues as one of the elements of this direction. One of the useful tools that we have in experimental psychology is the eye tracker. This is one designed by Mike Land, a biologist at Durham University in uh, Northern England. Uh, it's a head-mounted one. And it allows us to record where people are looking while they're going about their business walking around in the world. So some of the first things that people tried doing once head-mounted eye trackers were available was uh, just having people do mundane things. Uh, walking around, making a cup of tea, just recording what they were looking at, just out of interest because we've never been able to see that before. And my uh, former PhD supervisor, Gustav Kuhn, was a graduate student at Durham. And he thought, hey, be cool if we could see where people are looking while they're watching the magic trick. So uh, he used a deceptive study uh, design. They went to the local pub and they said uh, to people, we're doing an experiment in social psychology, just in how people interact with each other. So I'm just going to, uh, is it all right? Okay, and we'll put on this, uh, this eye tracker so that you can record where you're looking. Uh, just hold on while I uh, go get the uh, consent form. And while they're doing this, Gustav comes in and performs uh, a magic trick. He sits down across from them and says, hey, do you mind if I smoke? Uh, and does something with a lighter and a cigarette. I'm going to show you the video. And in the video, you'll, it, it's very crappy quality because this was over a decade ago. But you'll see a black square. And that black square represents one person's eye movements as they're watching Gustav perform live. Like the cigarettes. And, uh, oh, the lighter is on. And so is the cigarette. <laughs> Very quick. Uh, just to see whether you could track people's eye movements and see if the magician who's performing is actually controlling where people's eye movements go. And this created a whole new paradigm of research, magic and eye tracking, what we call gaze direction or misdirection. And uh, there's been all sorts of studies in the lab and in, uh, in uh, live settings to see where people are looking and how that can be changed by what the magician is saying and doing. So the next video I'll show you is a, a variation of that. That's much slower, much clearer. You should be able to see it, in which uh, he just does the trick with the lighter. And there are multiple dots. So that's an overlay of multiple people all watching the same video. And I want you to notice how all the dots move. Oh, sorry, this is the bench and ball illusion. We asked people where they think the ball is, and where did they see it when it disappeared? Where was the ball? Where did you see the ball for the last time when it disappeared? Well, 60 to 70 percent of people say it vanishes up here. But what's interesting is that they never look up there. When we run this in an eye tracker, we can see that people are looking at the hand, which, spoiler alert, the ball is simply retained it on the palm of rope. But the magician looks up. And when the magician looks up, People follow the gaze. And many people, as a result of this, see the ball <laughs> traveling up, even though there is no ball there. You are seeing something that isn't there based on context. Remember the triangle? Now, what happens if the magician doesn't look up on the final throw? 
<laughs> Very different experience, isn't it? You don't get that same sense of momentum. I don't even have a ball, but it still feels different for you as I'm watching. And indeed, the illusion collapses. No one experiences that vanishing ball. So the next video is the one where uh, where multiple people are watching uh, a lighter curve. Notice how all of those eye movements cluster like a swarm of bees. The magician is just totally orchestrating what everyone in the audience is looking through glances and hand motions. It doesn't take much because we uh, are automatically responding to these cues. They're sort of built in. I'll show you this next video, and this one doesn't have misdirection. The magician keeps looking at the hand that is going to be doing the dirty work. You might even see how the trick works. In case you didn't notice it, uh, he simply drops it. It's uh, like, oh, like his hand is here, it's dropped, it's fully visible on screen for about a few seconds. Um, he calibrated it precisely so that 50% of an audience would notice it, and 50% wouldn't, and then changed uh, the way that the magician performs to see if that 50% can be pushed around based on context. Uh, and when misdirection is being used, people just don't notice it. When misdirection is not being used, that detection rate increases. So where the magician looks has an impact on your ability to experience illusions. One of the things that's interesting I want you to notice that this person here is essentially looking directly at the cigarette when it vanishes in, in a slightly different variation of the same study. Looking right at it, but still doesn't detect it. In similar fashion, when people are looking directly at the screen, uh, the curtain at the back of that second gorilla video, and people still don't notice it. You can be looking at something, but not paying attention to it. That inspired uh, another experiment that's sort of based on that card trick I showed you, where there's two different locations of interest, my face and the cards down here. And when I want people to look away from the cards, one of the things that is often recommended by magicians is just ask them a question. So look at your face. You get to do the dirty work uh, with some real-world eye tracking, which looks a bit more modern than that ancient one from my plan. Uh, some messy, messy data. The green dot represents one person's eye movements as they're watching a similar card trick to the one I showed you. In this one, I think I asked people to remember one of the cards uh, without telling you. Just think of one of these cards. There you go, this sixth one. The cards are down. I ask them, do you remember your cards? They look up at me. When they look back down, the cards have changed from blue to red. Uh, and also, their card has vanished. But that's that's secondary to the fact that there's a visual change on screen at a different location from where I am directing their attention. Right? I want them to look at my face, but the change is happening down here. So because we're doing eye tracking and a change blindness experiment, we're combining the two, we can measure in two different locations where people are looking and whether they were paying attention to that location. We can also vary whether people know they're going to be misdirected or not. Uh, when people are told about misdirection, they look up less often, which is kind of cool. You're going to be misdirected. Ignore the magician's eye movements. People seem to be able to control their attention a little. But notice, that's still 50%. Even when I tell you specifically not to look up, Lucas, you still look right up at my face. It's very hard to ignore. The detection rate is different. Where you're looking seems to, at least in this situation, be uncorrelated with your ability to notice the color change of the cards. So there's a question. What exactly is drawing attention to the face? Why are you looking there? And why doesn't it seem to necessarily affect what you're capable of noticing? This, this was a replication attempt of a different study, and it did replicate. And now the next replication attempt of this study is failing. Science is hard, and that's why I left academia. <laughs> One of the things we found here is that a question on its own can get people to look at my face, but a question on its own doesn't change a people's ability to detect the color change. It's only eye contact that seems to affect whether you're able to notice things. 
we have a theory about this that's currently being tested, is that eyes aren't just for gathering visual information. Throughout this entire talk, I've been sort of using an efficiency metaphor. Right? It's an information gathering, it's an information theoretical, computer science-based metaphor of the mind. That it's processing information. Where eyes are somehow gathering things and we're doing something with them in our body, brain, computer. Um, but eyes aren't just for gathering information. We use them to communicate. Right? Social cues. We look at each other and tell things to each other using our eyes. So my hunch, if this replicates, is that questions get you to look up at my face but not change your attention because your eyes are being used to communicate that you acknowledge the question. Yeah, I remember my card. When I make eye contact on its own, you're wondering what the hell I'm doing staring at you. So your attention shifts because now you're gathering information. Still to be replicated. <laughs> I think it's a solid theory. We'll see. That's the bleeding edge of this research right now. The point is that eyes are magic <laughs> because they're really hard to ignore and magicians will use them as one of the tools in their arsenal of misdirection. So... The world is not what it appears to be. We do not see it accurately because we are constructing a perception of it based on the environment and our knowledge of it. And studying these kinds of illusions helps us understand how our minds work. By understanding where perception breaks down, by understanding why we get false memories, by understanding how magic works, we get a better understanding of our own minds. And magic and psychology are linked really tightly in this regard. Right from the very beginnings of psychology as an experimental science, we've been interested in understanding why people experience weird things. And one thing that we found from this research is that social cues are really powerful in this direction. They affect where you're looking and what you're paying attention to. Although where you're looking is always related to what you're paying attention to. Thanks very much.